Welcome to the Wilds Cast. Today I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Gad Yeshayahu, who is a PhD expert in international politics. Dr. Yeshayahu gives us an inside look as to the precarious position that Israel finds itself vis-a-vis Russia after its invasion of the Ukraine and why Israel's reaction isn't as simple as some may think. Tune in. Let's get into it. Okay, welcome to the Wilds cast. I am so pleased to be able to uh, introduce uh, an incredible scholar, Dr. Gadi Yishayahu, who is a visiting scholar in the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge. An honor to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us, God. Uh, God is a research fellow in the International Institute for Counterterrorism at the Reichman University in Herzliya. He's also a visiting lecturer in the Department of International Politics at the University of London, where he got his PhD. And his research concentrates on contemporary foreign policy crisis uh, and their uh, implications on the discipline of crisis management. And that's really why we wanted to have God come on the Wilds cast so we can pick his, his incredible brain on some of the crises that are going on today. Uh, God is a senior consultant to Israel's decision-making unit in the realm of crisis when it comes to foreign policy and national security. Uh, he worked in the field of crisis management, the office of the prime minister. He's also a lieutenant colonel <clears throat> in the IDF, where he served in the special forces and as the deputy in command of the national crisis management unit in the operation division of the chief of staff command. That's really long. Uh, today, he serves <laughs> as the head of the operations uh, for Major General Oded, how do you pronounce Oded's last name? Major General Basiuk. Oded. Basiuk. 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 Wow. Yep. Okay. Wow. Yeah. He's he's incredible. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Welcome. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, Rabbi uh, Wireless. Thank really an honor. And um and I thank our good friend uh, Itzik uh, for connecting us and bringing us together. So tell us. Let's get right into it. You're a crisis expert. You're doing research at Cambridge in this area. Tell us a little about uh, the Ukrainian situation, specifically as it pertains to Israel, because you're an expert, um, besides being a lieutenant a colonel in the IDF. Um, but um, how does this whole thing play out in terms of Israel? What issues does Israel face in standing up against Putin? Um, I guess given Russia's involvement in Syria and the fact that there's so many Russian Jews still you know, Jews still in Russia. T- tell us a little about that from your perspective. Well, thank you. That's that's in a very interesting question and in, in the progress, in the midst of, of the events. Um, I think we're dealing with an international crisis. I mean, by all means, this is an international crisis that shakes the international system. And when we analyze and scrutinize uh, the international system, we would like to go through a three-layer um, uh an analysis of the situation. And we'll start with the international context. Um, in, in the international context, we're dealing with one of the most significant events that occurred in the last 100 years. If I'm taking the First World War and the end of uh, the colonization uh, era, uh, the Second World War, obviously, the end of the Cold War in 1991 that no one expected, And right now, we're back into, I think, a tripolar Cold War, where Russia, China, and the U.S. are playing all over uh, the system. So this is the broad context that we usually start with. And obviously, we try to analyze each one of the players' interest in the region. So obviously, you're reading the the United States uh, uh, media and reports and uh, this uh, administration is a liberal administration, democratic liberal administrations uh, that perceive the world uh, with uh, a, a John Lockean approach, mm-hmm. uh, the famous book of John Lockean, The Two uh, Treaties of Government in mm-hmm. 1689. The philosophy is challenging Thomas Hobbes' philosophy, but Machiavellist uh, uh, approach that the world is an anarchy, uh, ruthless, uh, short, brutish, and short of uh, claimed rather but a condition of equality in which power and jurisdiction are reciprocal, okay? The human rights, etc. So mm-hmm. there's one philosophy 
uh, led by the U.S. and another philosophy led by uh, the ex-Soviet Union, uh, by uh, Vladimir Putin. And obviously many things were said and written about, about the philosophy. Uh, in this context, we're viewing um, consistency in Putin's approach that started since his election in 2000. And one of his first... Um, one of his first uh, um, um, approaches when he gave uh, an interview was that he would like to return the borders of the Soviet Union back to Russia. And he was very consistent about that. We could see it in 2007 in the Munich, uh, um, 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 I think it was in the Munich uh, Convention, uh, that he, he actually introduced his philosophy and it's an anti-Western philosophy mm -hmm. uh, where the West is actually threatening uh, Russia. And my field of research focuses on crisis and the theme of crisis was developed in the 60s by North American scholars mm -hmm. uh, like Graham mm -hmm. Ellison, who wrote The Essence of Decision Making. And what's very intriguing and interesting and striking about that is things didn't really actually change since 1962. In fact, what we see in the movies and what we tend to analyze as, as a very successful approach of, of the U.S. was, in fact, um, a counter-reaction to uh, uh, the Russian counter-reaction to the U.S. and NATO's uh, Jupiter missiles that were positioned in Turkey mm -hmm. and in North Italy. So let me just ask so, you if I, can, if I can stop you, God, for a second. So if, if Putin has been that consistent... And he's always been clear and transparent that he's trying to rebuild the former Soviet Union. So when he tried these things before with with uh, Georgia, with the Crimea, why didn't why do you think the West didn't do anything? Because now well, we're that's... saying now we're saying we can't do anything. It's going to turn into a third world war. But why didn't we check him back then if he was so consistent? You know, trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. That's a brilliant question, and I think Putin and the Soviet Union usually have a long-term strategy and this is something that um, characterizes the the foreign policy of, uh, of the soviet union and the russians so it starts with gas and money okay so the 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 russians are trying in 2000 to build they mm. built the Nord stream one pipeline and in a way they cooperated with the germans the germans mm. that are the leaders of the eu and we didn't hear a lot from the germans during this uh, crisis and suddenly, <laughs> the Europeans are dependent on the Russian gas. Mm -hmm. I lived in London until recently, and gas is something very expensive and needed. It's a cold country. So everyone is using gas, and the gas mostly arrives from Russia. My wife's from Italy. Everyone mm -hmm. knows that the gas arrives from Russia. So, in fact, he strangled like a bear the, the, the European economy and mm -hmm. created codependency through mm -hmm. the Russian gas. All the big companies that are producing in South Germany, in Bavaria, uh, cars, um, industry, heavy industries, depending on the, the Russian cars. Gerhard Schroeder was the, the CEO of that uh, pipeline, and he was an ex-president of, of Germany. This is why you didn't see Germany going in. So it's a wow. very... Wow. It's a I very, don't know how many... Uh, by the way, thank you for sharing that, because I don't know how many uh, our, our listeners are aware of that, of how... All of these years, he's sort of, you know, become, you know, developed a certain dependence that the West has become somewhat dependent on Putin and, and Russian gas. That's very important to know. It's, it's a very important uh, uh, thing. And in fact, America, that is considered maybe one of the biggest manufacturers of liquid gas, cannot, uh, uh, Qatar and America, in fact, mm -hmm. are considered one of the big uh, suppliers of liquid gas cannot supply gas to Europe because the ports are not uh, adjustable to the ships that are the containers that are bringing the gas. So I think Putin has a margin of two years that he could play his game in Ukraine and, and put facts on the ground, boots on the ground. Whereas the West, the American doctrine, the James Monroe doctrine, that was uh, the fifth president of the US that was established in the, in the beginning of the 1800s, uh, was that America is not interfering. Um, uh, its foreign policy position that opposed the European colonialism in the Western Hemisphere, and in turn, the U.S. would recognize and not interfere 
in the existing European colonies, nor meddle in the internal affairs in the European countries. So this doctrine was uh, doctrine was established and was it's a very strong doctrine. In fact, I would say something that would strike many of the listeners: uh, Trump, uh, Obama, and uh, Biden are are using this doctrine, each one from his perspective. Uh, Obama and Biden are looking at this doctrine through the liberal or neoliberal approach, whereas Trump is using the, the realist approach. But both of them wouldn't want the U.S. to be involved in wars around the world. So that's right. the main philosophy. Right. Now, going down to our region, and there's a thread that runs between, um, between Ukraine, Russia, Europe, and uh, the region when I call our neighborhood, the Shkuna, as we call it here. <laughs> Uh, and in the debates, in Israel's decision-making unit, is what are the ramifications and the implications and the opportunities uh, in this situation? So let's start with the Jewish point of view, as all of us. There are many Jews that live in Ukraine. There's Nachman's Uman and the Baal Shem Tov's tombs in Ukraine. Many Israelis bought properties in Ukraine in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, my son, my my son goes <laughs> went to Uman the last couple of years. It was shut down because of uh, because of uh, COVID last year. But uh, I mean, how many Jews go to Uman on Rosh Hashanah? It's a crazy 50, number. 50,000. 50, yeah. It's it's crazy. unbelievable. The phenomena. Yeah. Is, uh, I've been there in Purim uh, six years ago, and it was just it was thrilling. It was beautiful. So. Uh, there's a lot of a Jewish and, and a lot of narratives that are used by both sides, the Shoah, obviously the Holocaust, and uh, Babiar, and uh, you can see also Chernobyl and, and nuclear. Yeah. There are a lot of narratives that are climbing up through these uh, events. But there's a thread, and the thread runs between Israel, in our case, and our region, and especially Iran, and the bloc that Israel is trying to create against Iran. Now, the, it's not a secret. And I think everyone knows about it. New York Times published that Israel is starting to attack uh, Iranian targets and Hezbollah targets in mm -hmm. north, uh, in Syria, <clears throat> and even in Lebanon since 2012. So Israel seeks the opportunity. Netanyahu uh, orders the Air Force to strike as much as he can and, and demolish all kinds of weaponry and uh, um, um, uh, missiles that are sent from Iran to uh, to um, to to Lebanon. Lebanon holds today one hundred and fifty thousand rockets, different type of rockets. Some of them are very precise; they could hit a building and knock it 150, down. One hundred and fifty thousand. One hundred and fifty thousand. These are the estimations that are that the IDF is using, and it's a quite known thing. So this is an existential threat on Israel's uh, decision-making unit now. You should look at the broad context without deciding who do we like or not, because I work for Netanyahu and other prime ministers, but Netanyahu made the difference with Abraham Accords and the interest, when you look at the interest and the common goals between the Sunni Arab countries in the region that passed through a roller coaster in the last 10 years. You Crazy. know, yeah. when I was a child and I was, you know, walking around Judea desert, and I used to climb up on the cliffs and above Nachal Arugot, Arugot Stream and Matsoka Etekim, as we call. And I used to look at the other side of, of, of the Dead Sea, and that was a, 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 an Arab country that was a, as an enemy, Jordan. And, you know, Jordan is part of the peace process since the beginning of the 90s. Egypt yeah. is part of it. But now, the situation now is, is, is striking. It's unbelievable. The cooperation between the Sunni countries and Israel against Iran, and this is where we all meet again, the U.S. interest in the Mediterranean at the moment and the Iranian interest of expanding are meeting a strong coalition with Israel. Now, wow. Putin, is, Putin is our neighbor. Putin is domineering, you can say. He's controlling Syria. He has his army in Syria, and he allows, yeah, he enables Israel to attack Iranian targets. Okay? Uh -huh, He's uh -huh. the owner. He's the owner. Now, as Jews, we're trying to survive and stop all kinds of missiles arriving to Lebanon as a direct threat of the Iranians in, in the Golan. So we have to, you know, to walk around and walk together with Putin. And in fact, Netanyahu visited him quite a lot of times. I and mean, many of my colleagues sat in Putin's room and listened to him. 
And there was a good collaboration between um, Putin and Israel, Netanyahu's uh, government. And, and just, just uh, let, me, let me just stop you. And what was the reason why, why did Putin, or why does Putin continue to allow Israel to strike um, targets in Syria? Uh, wh- wh- why, why does he tolerate that? It's Iranian targets, okay? The deal is you can attack Iranian targets because eventually they're going to buy weapons from me. They won't buy them from, from the Americans. They're going to buy them from the Chinese or from me. It's all part of the business. In fact, the Iranians and, and the Russians are not the greatest friends, but uh-huh. they okay. have some common... All right, common so I, was, uh, I think that's values. what some people think, that Iran and Russia are like this, are, are like you know brothers, and therefore you know, it doesn't really make sense that Putin would tolerate that. But you're saying they're not such beloved uh friends there it, it's it's a business situation and and putin it is you know. it is it's politics i think the only friend of putin is putin himself and in politics <laughs> as we know uh, friendship is temporary hatred is uh, yeah. animosity is temporary interests are internal so when the interests meet you know then hence you find a, a common goal together mm-hmm. so putin is enabling israel to attack in syria mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a significant event okay we attacked there we attacked israel attacked there according to different publications hundreds hundreds of times since 2012 to to prevent to prevent whatever iranian buildup of missiles to sort of keep that in check yeah yeah to prevent them arriving to to destroy them a b to prevent them from arriving to lebanon and hence uh, uh, create a, a, a direct threat on Israel, mm-hmm. and we're not talking about you know five point five fifty six little bullets. We're talking about heavy missiles that can destroy Israel and hit every target in Israel. Every every just but, but, but you're saying every Lebanon place. already has that anyway. You're saying it would just be more. I mean, you... Le- when I say Lebanon, Lebanon is Hezbollah. Right. Hezbollah is the proxy of, of right. Iran. Right. So I got you. Yeah, it's the octopus mm-hmm. that sends its uh, tentacles. Yeah. So. So this is the this is now it sits in in front of Bennett's uh, uh, table and he needs to decide who he's going with. The heart is with the Ukrainian, the atrocities and whatever is happening there tears everyone apart. We, we just, just so you're war. listening, Naftali, you're just referring to Naftali Bennett, the current prime minister of yeah. Israel. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the crime mm-hmm. prime minister who has, if we were honest, who has no legitimacy inside Israel domestically, he has only six mandates. So. He, ha- he wasn't cho- chosen by the majority of the Israelis, mm-hmm. decision maker. But then he has the opportunity to try and become a kind of a messenger. I wouldn't even say a med- mediator between the sides. And he grabs the situation, he flies to Russia, meets Putin, and he's trying to kind of jingle between all these balls together and, and create something. Now, unfortunately, and this is part of the Israeli decision making process, uh, Israel hasn't got a you know a long-term strategy. It lives through the moment. We say in Israel, "Zmani zachi kavuashiyesh." Temporary is the most. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So this is how Israel lives. And we had a problem with uh, um, uh, the president of Ukraine because he wanted to perform in front of our parliament and try to think about it. Israel is the fifth country that he wants to perform in front. When he was a com- fifth country. When he was a comedian, you mean? No, no, we're talking lately. Oh, he performed. Um, uh, performing. Okay, yeah, I didn't follow Sorry. that. Approaching, approaching the party. Oh, yeah, performing. No, yeah, he, he's a very good performer. He was a comedian, so I'm thinking. I don't know. Yeah, maybe yeah. they need some stand up in the Knesset. <laughs> no, yeah, it's uh, uh, you know, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> okay. and, uh, um, so Valensky wants to to talk to the Israeli Parliament, and he chooses Israel after uh, the House of Commons in England, um, the U.S., Canada. Germany. So Israel is the fifth country of the EU was also the parliament of the mm-hmm. EU. In all these countries, he was received with open hands. All the parliament was there. People applaud him. And in Israel, as Israelis, uh, we, we couldn't find the right, right words to, to, to try and handle the situation. We couldn't choose between, okay, Vladimir, you can come and speak. We would listen, obviously, because we're Jewish and you're a Jew. And, and you represent many people in the world, and maybe Israel could be a, a kind of a mediator between uh, uh, you and Putin. But then there are all kinds of excuses that the Knesset is passing through a renovation, and uh, and they don't uh, and they don't want you know, and they don't want to do this because they they're they're nervous <clears throat> about 
what it's going to do with their relationship with Russia? Obviously. So Israel is between two very powerful situations that are uh, the ramifications, the implications of each choice, each choice could harm Israel. But eventually, uh, Vladimir uh, um, um, Valinsky is, is pre- performing. He's, he's standing in front of the Knesset through Zoom, mm-hmm. and he gives a speech, and he's trying to compare the situation that Ukraine is passing to the Shoah, and that irritates many people in mm-hmm. Israel. Mm-hmm. So, so Israel is still playing a very important role in this, uh, in this conflict, in this crisis. But simultaneously, Israel is trying to create a block, and this is the point, and this is a very interesting block. Israel is trying to create a Sunni block to block the Iranian deal and the Americans. How? Putin is asking, the thing is, Putin says, if you want me to sign on this deal, the, the, the Iranian uh, deal, uh, I'm asking the Americans to let me trade freely with Iran. Now, if Biden allows such a thing, he's just legitimizing his 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 um, enemies, barbarian. Yeah. yeah, and if not, Putin won't sign the deal. Hence, there's no deal. So it's very sensitive. It's very complicated the situation at the moment. But Israel, perhaps, and the Israeli government could, you know, create some quite interesting situations with the Arab countries around. So you're saying that, uh, just to have some clarity here, Israel is reticent to take on Putin too much, and they were even hesitant to allow him to speak to the Knesset because if they tick off Putin too much, it could affect negatively Israel from, uh, in terms of what's happening in Syria or, or um, Hezbollah, uh, getting more arms through Syria. Um is that the main reason? And, and how are people dealing with this, I guess, on a moral level? Because, you know, in terms of what Putin is doing to the Ukrainian people, obviously, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's barbaric. And um, Israel has to sort of turn a blind eye in order to, I guess, to protect itself. I mean, that's what you're saying, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, sure. and, and then in terms of the deal with Iran, how is this all playing with the deal of Iran? In other words... Putin is only going to sign it. P- Putin is only going to sign it if he can continue to trade with Iran. Exactly. And and and, exactly. and Biden is going to go for that. Biden is going to push a deal that gives Putin. Very tricky. I mean, it's crazy. I understand from Israel's perspective, but the United States is sort of leading the Western world in condemning Putin, and that same world Western leader is going to now um, sign a deal. That Putin is party to that allows Putin to trade freely with Iran. Yeah. What? What? Uh, this situation created a lot of opportunities to Israel, because Israel would try to do anything to prevent this sure, deal from sure. coming through. And this is why Yair Lapid, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs, met in Ben Gurion in the Negev two days ago. Five ministers uh, of Foreign Affairs: Secretary Blinken and the Egyptian. The Moroccan, uh, the Emirates, uh, the Bahrainian uh, foreign ministers uh, to talk about the nuclear uh, deal. And here's the problem: the problem is that Biden needs Putin. He needs Putin to sign the deal. Mm-hmm. And if he hasn't got Putin approval, there's a problem. And Israel, I think, behind the screen, Israel is trying to utilize as maximize this friction uh, about the deal. I mean, how does? I'm curious. I mean. How could uh, how could Biden, how could President Biden get away with making a deal with Putin at this time when he's publicly, you know, declaring him a war criminal? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question. And I think we're going to see part of it coming out soon. But Israel is trying to dig this hole and expand this hole uh, and make a, a, a giant out of this little important issue that actually stops the whole thing. So I think Israel would try with the Arab countries, and this is what's happening behind the scene, obviously, to say, you know, even going to Russia and telling Putin, you know, you mustn't sign this deal. We will, we will, you know, we will play the game with you. Now in the region, in our neighborhood, Putin is perceived by the Arab leaders as a very strong uh, leader. Mm-hmm. If, if you're part of his bloc, like Bashar Assad was, 
he will die for you. He will protect you. So in many, in you know, when you look back, if I zoom out again and look at Americans, America's role in the region and what happened in the last 30 years, and I'll go just down to the numbers, and that's a very interesting thing because uh, I've, I've managed to... Um, uh, see through the, uh, I think it was the ministry, uh, the American Ministry of Defense, the numbers uh, of dollars the Americans spend uh, in wars in the last uh, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's start with uh, the military deaths in the war of Afghanistan. There were uh, in, in Afghanistan is 2,401 and in, uh, in uh, Iraq, it was, sorry, in Iraq, 2,401 in Afghanistan, 1,921. Mm -hmm. There were around 34 Americans, service members who were wounded. Okay. And now let's go to the numbers. And that's a very interesting thing. In World War I, the US was spending, according to 2019 measures, $381 billion. Korean War, $389 billion. Vietnam War, $843 billion. And listen to this. The war in Afghanistan, $910 billion, oh. and the war in Iraq, $1.1 trillion, oh. more or less $2 trillion. So America is very tired. And when you go back and you look at the region and, and you see what's happening, America is pulling back. It, it was too much. Mm -hmm. It's too much. The Americans are not interested in what's happening. This is why they would sign a deal with Iran. But the thing is, if they want it or not, they're involved. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's, do you think, I'm curious, I'm asking you to put on a different uh, hat for a minute, not your public policy crisis management hat. Different yarmulke. A different, a different, different, ki different kippah cane. Kippah. Um, All right. From a, a, a Jewish moral perspective, okay, do you think that the world should enforce a no-fly zone over and help the Ukrainians? I'm not saying boots on the, on the ground. But a no-fly zone is also a very serious thing. That's a, it's an act of war against Russia. Do you think that, because I'm, I'm struggling, I'm being honest, this is 100% autobiographical. I hear everything that you're saying about Israel, and I'm almost happy that Israel can somehow exploit this terrible situation for its own benefit. When I say that specifically, I mean to get rid of the Iranian deal. Maybe this whole thing... Yeah. We'll get rid of the Iranian deal. And what's amazing I'm hearing from you is that the first time Israel can now work with Arab Sunni neighbors to get rid of this Iranian deal. That's great. But my question is from a moral point of view, how do we, well, how do we justify just watching, you know, Russia pummel Ukraine, attack trains and buses as innocent people are fleeing the country? Shouldn't we be doing more than just telling Putin how upset we are with him? I think, I mean, there are two layers to this uh, a very interesting question. And if we go to the Jewish philosophy and go to the Talmud, the Mishnah, mm -hmm. and that's the philosophy, the Jewish philosophy that runs like a thread since the establishment. J just the thread. explain that to our listeners. Not everybody's Hebrew is so uh, fluent here. So, kodemet, the poor people in your city are more important than the poor people from the other city. If you have to spend or give something to eat and you have to choose between two groups, right. you would go first to the poor people right. of your city. Well, we, they call that America. Mishnah. Charity begins at home, doesn't end at home, but yeah. it starts at home, right? Yeah. So this is, this is one important thing. Israel is struggling uh, seven years and surviving, and you heard about the terror attacks yesterday. Yeah. Domestically, Israel is in a very fragile situation, and the Iranians are increasing their attempts to struggle Israel from all directions. Yeah, there were four, okay? four Jews in Beersheba that were killed last week as well. And yesterday, two soldiers, two, soldiers, two days ago, yeah. two soldiers that, uh, and six people were wounded by guys from ISIS, okay? So radical Islam hits Israel. Israel is surrounded by, by countries, and if we won't go into the narratives, because there are different narratives, depends on your political point of view. Truly, Israel is struggling. Uh, Israel is struggling quite a lot with survival issues or high priority goals of national security. It's things that majority of Americans didn't experience 
up until 9-11, okay? This is where it started hitting America yeah, inside. Yeah. But, but when you're going back to the question, I think if we're honest with ourselves as Jews and we see what happened in Syria and the Arab world around us in the last 10 years, it's not so different from Ukraine. The thing is, Ukraine photos are, are matching more the Western uh, liberal order. Mm -hmm. You know, it meets the, this is why they get, but, but what's happening here in the last 10 years is the same, same thing. thing. It, it's yeah. the atrocities of war. And when I lived in Tel Aviv, we picked up all kinds of clothes for Syrian babies, you know, to the borders. Jews, yeah. Syria was a Syria was an enemy country. It, sti it still is an enemy country. So definitely when I look at what's happening in Ukraine, my heart and storm, babies, children, whatever. But you can say the same thing about Israel. 100%. With Gaza, with Gaza, with Gaza. Other people that would see what we're doing in Gaza could, could say the same sentences. So morally, no one of us uh, is... As Jewish people, I mean, I, I can talk about myself, and this is what I told my soldiers, and this is Ben Gurion's famous uh, sentence. If we need to use the sword, we should know how to use it, but we would never want to use it. We, we're not interested in using a sword per se. Uh, however, um, I think that the, the international system, and you would probably see it with China and other countries, it happened between China and India on the border, two superpowers, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the summer. So war is inevitable, unfortunately, and since Cain uh, ve'evel, and we're going back to the Genesis, Parashat Bereshit, since Cain and Hevel, this is part of our life. It's part of our life, and you can't hide it underneath the table. Mm -hmm. This is part of the human DNA, unfortunately. The question is, how do we have to behave? And it's a very good question. So morally, Israel is trying to do anything and everything it could to support refugees mm -hmm. and, and, and obviously Jewish people. And we see here in TV all kind of Chabad guys that are driving into the war zone and rescuing Jews and bringing medicine and, you know, behaving in, in such an amazing and, as and, and Israel courageous. As Israel always does. As Israel always does. Yeah. Yeah, but unfortunately, uh, this situation uh, with Putin is very delicate, as I mentioned yeah. before. So we're trying to walk in between the lines. Well, thank you. This is very, very helpful. Tell us what is um, what, what is Israel doing? You just started touching on that. Maybe you can share uh, any idea. Maybe you don't know the numbers of how many refugees are coming into Israel. I, I interviewed the chief rabbi of Poland, who's a friend, Rabbi Michael Shudrick. And he's told me that in Poland, where two of the three million refugees are now, you know, many of the Jewish ones are making plans to get to Israel, particularly the ones who have family there. Um, what, what, what is Israel doing to absorb um, Ukrainian refugees into the country? So, um, first of all, if I could elaborate a little bit about the difference between the major big aliyah yeah. uh, in the 1990s, in the beginning of the 1990s, in the end of the Cold War, uh, the majority of the Ukrainian people and the Russian Jews that came out from the Soviet Union were poor people. They, they, they were not rich, and, and you know, it's, it's a different context. We're talking about a very different situation at the moment. Many of the Israelis, Jews, the Russian and the Ukraine, Jews that made Aliyah in the 1990s returned either to Ukraine, either to Russia with money. So it's a different <laughs> scenario. OK, That's, this is a very important thing. But Israel as Israel, it's a country that knows how to behave in a crisis, knows very well how to build up uh, quite fastly uh, all kinds of new cities uh, or, or new buildings and, and to approach it. But yet again, Israel has its uh, its problems, you know, the, the, the mechanism, the government, the, the, the bureaucratic uh, level is quite complicated. It's not like the U.S., OK? But I believe that Israel will manage to to support the majority of, uh, of the people that are coming here quite sufficiently. It's amazing. You know, um, I think in the 1990s, uh, Israel, I think its Jewish population was approximately 5 million. Is this correct? And they absorbed almost a million one million. Yeah. 
I don't know if people realize what it is for a population of 5 million to absorb 1 million in a decade. You know, it was a miracle. It was a miracle, Rabbi Wally. It was a miracle, definitely. It was the Jewish heart of opening, opening everything. Again, you know, many of the Jews left to Canada, to the U.S., to Europe, and returned to Ukraine mm-hmm. because they, you know, it's, Israel is a tough country to integrate. Yeah. Let's be honest, you know, it's not an right. easy one for many of us, but still, there's a Jewish heart there and open arms. And tell us just one last question, because I know that this is something you personally were involved in as a crisis uh, researcher and a lieutenant colonel in the reserves. If you could share your views, not many people are aware of the historic visit of the Israeli president to Turkey, which took place somewhat recently. Um, if you can tell us a little about that and what that means. Uh, Turkey. <laughs> Turkey is a very interesting uh, case. And if we put aside Erdogan and, and just, you know, freeze it just for a second. Turkey is, is a very interesting and important country, and it was the first Muslim, not Arab country, that recognized Israel, per se, in, 14, in 1949, okay, a year after Israel's declaration. And since then, Israel had a very interesting relation with uh, Turkey, mostly based, uh, I divided it in my research to uh, three dimensions, okay, three spheres. The first one is rapprochement, uh, closeness, mm-hmm. in a way. And Israel and Turkey are integrated uh, as a love affair uh, during the 90s, the golden era. And uh, they uh, work together in different spheres, political, um, foreign policy, military and commercial and trade. Uh, The second uh, uh, phase is a different phase, is um, um, the phase of um, friction. And this is what happened since, since 2008, since... Erdogan actually uh, came into power in 2002. Israel attacked in Gaza in 2008. Erdogan said that it betrayed it betrayed him because he was negotiating with Eud Olmert on an agreement mm-hmm. with uh, uh, with Syria. And behind the back, Israel attacked uh, uh, Gaza, and there was a war in Gaza. And uh, it arrived to Paris uh, event in Davos and the Mavi Mamra, the famous Mavi Mamra uh, flotilla, flotilla yeah. where, where Israel. Yeah. Yeah, killed 10 Turkish, uh, very not nice guys. Right, let's let's right. put it in, in the context. Right, that you know, whole, that, some of them right, are terrorists. That, that was and, mis, mis, uh, not portrayed accurately, I remember, in the media at the time. Israel was made to yeah. look like they uh, took over some ship or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, violently and killed. And there was many uh, panels in the United Nations, Palmer Report, etc. Since then, Israel and Turkey are clashing. And definitely Erdogan doesn't add a lot of... Uh, he's not helping. <laughs> he's not helping of, the situation. No. He's not the helpful guy. He's not the guy who relaxes the situation. But then Erdogan, as a politician who wants to survive, needs Israel at the moment because he gambled in the last years on the wrong side. And Israel, in fact, since the Mamara, elaborated, uh, 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 collaborated with many countries in the region. And his problem at the moment is that he needs money. Mm-hmm. And needing money, he needs the the U.S. Mm-hmm. and Israel, and he chooses the president. But his brother is the is the is the ambassador of Israel in Washington, so uh, doesn't threat. He's not a threatening type, and uh, he needs Israel's help. He needs Egypt's help because he's 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 losing. He's losing the power. Uh, the opposition is taking over. Hence, he invites Israel. And this is where, when people meet, eventually interests meet Israel. Uh, um, Herzog is flying to to meet Erdogan. Historically, this is the first visit since two thousand and seven, and it went very well. That's wonderful. And at the moment, yeah, Erdogan is hosting Hamas leaders. It should be noted. Yeah, he's not one of Chovevetzion, as we call. It. He's not one <laughs> the of lovers the most of Zion, admiring guys of right. yeah. However, the interest right now serves him. And in fact, yesterday he hosted, or today, the, the meeting between the Russians and the Ukraine. So Israel and Turkey are working together also on this issue, on this crisis in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and I mean, Russia. so that could be only good, potentially. I mean, I don't want to get overly optimistic, but the fact that you have an Israeli leader going to Turkey and meeting um, with their prime minister can only be 
a positive thing as far as you're concerned, no? You know, one head of the Mossad that I worked with once told me a very, sent a very interesting sentence. Uh, he said, everything begins and ends with people. It's right. all about people. And, you know, Israel and, and Turkey has many common interests, especially what's happening in Syria, the war, the war in Syria, Daesh, ISIS, you know. So I think when people manage to find the, what we call Abraham and Lot, Emek HaShaveh, <laughs> the equal yeah. valley, yeah. yeah, then obviously uh, things happen together. But with some of the leaders that are narcissists or problematic, you know, it's it's not working together. <laughs> Biden doesn't like um, uh, um, President uh, right. Erdogan. There's no chemistry right. there and friction even. Yeah. It's fascinating what, what is, you know, um, I really thank you for your time. If there's any um, anything else you think you know, our listeners, what we should be doing uh, besides visiting Israel, supporting Israel, um, you know, contributing and praying for world peace and anything else. Obviously, we're going to, you know, we're, I'm encouraging my students, my participants to give to humanitarian uh, uh, causes. Are, are there any, I mean, this is not your area really, but are there any specific causes, let's say, in Israel helping to absorb Ukrainian refugees that you would recommend or that's not really your um because a lot of a lot of the money Listen, is going to help in Poland and in Ukraine I'm sure a lot of Jewish people would prefer sending the money to Israel especially if it's helping to resettle you know Ukrainian Jews back in the homeland um listen this is again the beautiful uh, uh relations that Israel has with uh with America and especially with the Jewish congregation in America. And that opens the heart, especially towards Pesach. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're coming out from, you know, uh, from the darkness of Egypt, of, of the war into another situation and into another scenario. If, if you, my humble perception is that I think we should expand the dialogue, first of all, between us, between the Jewish congregations, in Israel and and uh, and the U.S., the diversity of the congregations, because at the moment everyone in Israel is aware of the friction, a kind of a friction between some parts of the American uh, Jewish congregations and Israel mm -hmm. as a government, mm -hmm. you know, as the land, the house of the Jewish uh, 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 people. So, if if you would ask me strategically, what would I expect? I would expect uh, uh, strengthening bonds arriving to Israel, delegations, trying to do anything we can to unite because we have we have something in common. And obviously that would in, influence uh, everything else. But I think this is one layer. Uh, I know that a moshav nearby me uh, called Nes Harim, Miracle of the Mountains. It's above Bet Shemesh. There's a, they're hosting many of the Ukrainian mm -hmm. people, the mm -hmm. children, children that came, orphan children that will spread all over the Ukraine. Uh, and I think the money for these uh, children that are orphans uh, would definitely uh, help a lot in their education and integration in Israel. And I would be more than happy to, to connect. Yeah, if uh, you can, that would you that would be really today. wonderful. You, If you could share maybe a link that I can share with my students, with our participants, with anyone um, here in the United States to help support um, and integrate those orphans into Israeli life. And uh, I appreciate you bring up Pesach because this is uh, the Shabbat will be Chodesh Nisan, which is the month of Geulah, yeah. the month of redemption. And this is uh, there have been a lot of great miracles for the Jewish people for the world in this month. And please God, um, we should see we should see peace and we should see miracles and we should see somehow the the Jewish people and Israel, um, you know, remaining safe and secure. And as you just said before, how important it is for us in America to be connected, whatever our ideology is, whatever affiliation we may have with whatever community, Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, unaffiliated, doesn't matter. There's one Jewish homeland. There's one Jewish place where Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valea came from. It's the one Jewish nation. I, I will tell you, we're, we're planning a trip. Um, we've been kept from Israel. 
I, I've been there personally, but MJE, the organization I run, has brings two groups every summer. I've been doing it for over 20 years, and I'm so excited. We're coming back July 16th, Bizrat Hashem. We're going to be bringing two groups to Israel. Uh, we hope to also visit the Knesset um, and and just re-establish the incredibly important ties that Jews must have with each other, irrespective of where we live. Because Kimitzion Tetze Torah, it is from Zion that Torah comes, and that is the place. Look where, look where these Ukrainians have a place to go now. You know, last yeah. time Jews were running away from Poland and Ukraine, there was no government, there was no army, there was no state for them to go to, to be in Israel. And today, thankfully, thanks to you, uh, a lieutenant colonel in the IDF, and thanks to all of the incredible work that you do, uh, God, uh, Gadi, excuse me, um, it, 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 uh, you're a real hero for the Jewish people, not just because you're a brilliant scholar in international affairs uh, and a research fellow at Cambridge, but because you care so deeply. I see it in your eyes. Uh, your, your, your heart is in Israel. And I congratulate you and bless you. You should continue to go mechayel chayel from strength to strength. I thank you, um, really, Dr. Gad Yishayahu. Thank you so, so much for, for being with us and illuminating the very delicate situation. Because people have been critical of Israel. Why isn't Israel coming out? More against Putin. Why isn't, you know, very complicated. Not so simple. Um, so no. thank you so, so much for your no. time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rabbi Wildis. And please, God, if you're going to come and visit here, hopefully we'll ah, meet. It'll be a pleasure. I could show you some very interesting, you and your students, some very different perspective and interesting things. Thank you. Okay? Thank we'll you. Be in touch. Thank you so much. Hag Hag Sameach Sameach. to you. Happy Pesach. Hag yeah. Sameach to all of, all of the students.